Greetings and salutations, guys. Eric here with my review of In a Violent Nature, uh, a new low-budget horror movie coming out that is uh, an interesting reflection on 1980s slasher films, specifically Friday 13th. Uh, we'll get to that in one moment, but thanks for watching, and if you could like and subscribe, that would be wonderful. Um, let me dive into this movie. You know, it's, it's funny timing. This film is opening um, May 31st in theaters, and uh, we are coming off a month with a lot of news about Friday 13th, which is no Friday 13th movie to actually see. It's been, uh, got 15 years, I think, since the last Friday 13th movie, uh, the longest gap ever. And um, there's been so many legal issues holding it up. And then just in the past month, Brian Fuller dropped out of the Crystal Lake TV series, which is a huge bummer. Uh, and then we heard about the Jason universe, where some of the rights owners are going to use the character for new merch and video game appearances but not an actual movie. And then we heard Jason's in the multiverses game, uh, which is all interesting stuff if you're a longtime fan like me of the character in the franchise, but also frustrating because can we just get a new Friday 13th movie? I mean, Brian Fuller doing Crystal Lake sounded amazing, but we're not even going to get that. Maybe we'll get the show still, but it won't be his version. Uh, so a strange time for the character where a lot is being written about the character and the franchise, but we're not actually getting anything new. And in the midst of that, In a Violent Nature is coming out in theaters, and it's a really cool, interesting... Uh, deconstruction isn't quite the right word, because it's a perspective shift. It's not it's not plot-wise a deconstruction, but it's just like, what if we followed Jason the whole movie? And I'm bringing up Jason specifically because, yes, there are a lot of 1980s slasher movies, and there are a lot of the ones set at summer camps. It wasn't only Friday 13th, but Friday 13th is certainly the one you most think of about summer camp slasher horror, and it's clearly the inspiration for this movie, down to the killer being uh, a guy named Johnny, how he looks, his backstory involving what happened to him as a kid decades before, clearly huge Friday 13th influence in a way that I really appreciated. And this is a funny movie because it's this um, sort of intersection of Friday 13th with kind of art house horror in a way that um, you wouldn't get from a Friday 13th movie, even though it'd be really interesting if they ever actually did this with Jason. Maybe if Brian Fuller had done the TV show, we could have got an episode like this. Who knows? Uh, so, yeah, story-wise, I mean, it's a Friday 13th movie, basically. There is a killer out in the woods who, once in a while, gets resurrected, rises back up, uh, and starts going around the woods and killing anyone he comes across. Gives him a specific little goal here, a sort of a keepsake that he's after. But otherwise, you know the basics. And again, there is also that familial tie, like Friday 13th. There's a little bit of a motivation that goes back to his parents and how that ties into it. But the big thing here is we stay with the killer. It is all from the killer's perspective. We don't have scenes away from there's almost no scenes in this movie that the killer isn't present for. Um, as the movie goes on, it kind of breaks its own rules a little bit in ways that I think I appreciate sometimes and sometimes I wish it had held back from. But by and large, I really loved what you could kind of call the experiment of this movie, which is what if we did this perspective? There is a moment, for instance, where the killer, uh, Johnny, um, chases after someone. Someone sees Johnny and goes racing away into the woods, except instead of it being a moment that's cutting back and forth and following the person running as they're screaming and intense music playing and maybe we cut back once in a while to the killer it's just following the killer and what is their route. And maybe even explaining a little about how in Friday 13 movies, Jason always seems to uh, beat people to where they're going, despite not actually being a teleporter. I really like that. I really the stark approach. There's no score to this movie. It is all just, you know, following along. It also will remind you a lot of a third person video game at points, specifically the Friday 13th one, if you played it, uh, because of how we're following the character through. Like I said, it does break its own rules a couple times at key points, and I, I'm sure they were sort of meticulously planned because there are important moments. For instance, when we meet the core group of characters, we do suddenly cut a bit to the close-ups of them. It's just sort of one long sort of spinning shot of them happens for a while, even though we know the killer is there watching them. We followed him the whole way up there. Now we go to them for just a little bit, then we go back to the killer. Most of the time, though, the conversations are happening from afar. And it's like if someone walks away into a room, we don't follow them. We don't hear the rest of it. We can fill in the gaps. It actually reminds me a lot, this movie, of Cloverfield. This is not a found footage movie in any way. There's no cameraman following this killer around. But 
the way that Cloverfield was taking the idea of there's a giant Godzilla movie happening and we can imagine the scenes happening with the government and people inside, you know, um, these buildings and saying, what can we do and making big decisions? And we don't see any of that. We're just following these people on the other side. This kind of reminds me of that, even though except here we're following the killer, you know, instead of be like a Cloverfield was like behind Godzilla the whole movie. That'd be interesting too, wouldn't it? Um, so yeah, I really dug the sort of vibe of this movie, the dread of the movie. You know, it's it's played obviously deadly serious. You know, you're not going to be goofy in the circumstances of this film. Um, and I think it, it did draw me in with how it's, you know, how that all is done and how it just feels this very sort of a, uh, spooky creepy vibe of following behind this this creature this thing who never speaks like jason big hulkin guy eventually gets a mask um it does go on a little too long it's almost inevitable it becomes repetitive because there's a lot of long shots of him walking through the woods it'll do some little time cuts uh but you know after a few of those times you kind of get get the idea so maybe they could have pulled back a little bit on that but i think it's you know part of what they're doing the other part where they change perspective and kind of break their own rules a little bit is the kills and there is a part of me that would appreciate if the movie never broke its rules and we're just behind this guy and what maybe what we see what we glimpse is what we glimpse of these moments when he kills someone um instead we do get a little bit of editing of you know cutting back and forth in a couple of the kill scenes even though it's still again done pretty sort of stark and um, the image rarely moves. The camera is either held in place or very slow pans. But it still kind of gives you a little more in the kill scenes. However, as a big horror fan, a big Friday 13th fan, I also appreciated the hell out of this. Because guess what? The kills really deliver. Um, it's a fun boy thing they did in this movie, which is a couple of times they do keep them from afar. And we just see someone screaming on the water and we don't see what's happening below the water. And we can fill in the blanks and imagine anything happening. But... There are some parts where we do get uh, some very visceral kills, and they're rather amazing. Uh, there's one that's being talked about a lot from this movie, and there's a reason. Because if it happened in a Friday 13th movie, we would call it one of Jason's all-time greatest, most memorable, most insane kills. Because it's very memorable and insane. <laughs> and uh, definitely got a big... I saw this uh, movie at a very early morning screening, uh, and that got a big reaction from people. Because it's hard not to... Uh, with what happens to someone's anatomy and things happening that aren't supposed to happen. But if you are a slasher fan uh, and you are a little sick, as we all are uh, for slasher fans, uh, easy to cheer for. Um, but like I said, it's so funny because this movie plays it so sort of um, so stark. It feels like this art house movie. I know that Chris Nash, the writer director, has said Terrence Malick was an influence. You can feel that. Um, I didn't love the last few minutes, and maybe that's part of me having certain expectations. Uh, I'm trying to, I don't want to be spoilery, but I guess this is reverse spoilers, right? Or, or non-spoilers, because I'm going to mention something that doesn't happen in the movie. All right, you ready? Um, we don't get sort of a final girl chase in the way I expected from the killer's perspective. It, what, it, something happens that does kind of flip up the movie in a way it hasn't done the whole time. And so I was a little disappointed because I wanted to see how the movie was going to handle the usual conclusion of a Friday 13th movie. And they didn't do that. But I did start to appreciate more what we get instead. I haven't mentioned the cast because they are kind of kept at arm's length. Uh, although a huge shout out to Rye Barrett, who plays Johnny and is the guy at the center of the screen for almost the entire movie and is an amazing presence doing that. But Lauren Marie Taylor shows up near the end and she is an, an actor who is in Friday 13th part two. I will always remember her, A, because I like her character, and B, because she has a shot uh, with Jason, uh, his knife coming at her, kind of over his shoulder, and her crouching in fear that gets used a lot. A lot of the flashbacks in the series use it. It's a great shot, so it's an iconic image. She comes in, and she gives a really great performance in a movie that has a lot of stilted acting, and it kind of works for what they're doing, but you know, you kind of have that feeling of not really investing in these characters, which you're not even supposed to, because they're not supposed to be full in-depth characters but she comes in and delivers a hell of a monologue and does it really well and uh it's a great sort of set piece for her the movie ended in yeah there was something i wanted a little more maybe that it wasn't giving me but i still thought overall it was a really cool experience um this is a niche movie because friday 13th audience is niche and now it's asking that audience to accept something that is an interesting experiment that maybe might have been better served as you know a shorter form thing than a, i think this movie is an hour and 34 minutes 
But I think if you go with it, it can be, I don't want to say a good time because it's not trying to be a good time, but a really fascinating time. And uh, yeah, you know, there was a couple quibbles I had along the way there with, again, a few too many walking scenes maybe, um, and a couple of those perspective shifts. But overall, I really uh, appreciated what they were doing here. And um, man, I wish uh, it would be great if we could have actually seen a Jason movie or TV show do something like this. But first, we need to get actual Jason back on screen in live action. And it's taken a long time. So in the interim, I'm very glad we have In a Violent Nature here uh, to give us this sort of um, alt-world version. So those are my thoughts on the movie. Uh, it opens, like I said, this weekend uh, from IFC. Um, and it will be eventually on Shudder down the line. But for now, you should see it in the theater. All right, guys. Thanks. Take care.